All right, it's nine o'clock. Get everything adjusted up here. I'm supposed to be live, and I am live in Facebook and YouTube. And the purpose of the night would be to just demo what I have and what I plan on bringing to the training market. And so if you're watching, all you have to do is post a comment in either Facebook or YouTube. If the comment comes in, I can read it and respond to it. And that makes it work a lot better. So I know I'm not just talking to nobody. And so I'll wait about five minutes. And then if we don't have any particular comments, or question, you know, just when you comment, it could be a form of question to say, hey, does your site do this? Does your site do that? And uh, if not, I will just jump in there and demo. I'm not showing any live viewers yet on either Facebook or YouTube. And it's just barely after 9 o'clock. And I'll wait five minutes, and if that comes in, you want to quote chat by just post a comment, and we can uh, get that going. And like I say, I will crank it up, say, at uh, five minutes in, which is a few minutes away. <clears throat> Of course, this will go out as a, I will edit this down and post it back as a, as a pre, as a recording, so to speak. Do I have one on Gearhead School? All right, I'm coming up on five minutes in. I will crank up in a couple minutes. I see we have a viewer or two. Just a fin reminder, all you do is post a comment and put your platform your own. I can read those comments and then respond to that right here in the panel on the right hand side. You see a, a feed there. So you'll see your question come up. I'll bring it in and address that. So just a couple more minutes, I will start. It's demo on what I can do, what a site does. And I'd love to have some questions so I can kind of demo uh, more stuff. I'll, I can uh, go away here in a second. And it may make it easier for me to demo the site quicker without having to look up and see if I'm, uh, if the camera's working or whatever. So this platform, I can do this, I can do this, I can come back and do that, go back to that, do that. <laughs> uh, that's a little scary, just me all alone. Let's do this. All right, let's let's get this party started. Let's get this party started. I'm trying to figure out. I'll be looking to the right, but I've got to deal with some screens here. All right, here we go. Gearhead School is not a real brick and mortar school. I just thought it was a catchy name, and many years ago, you wake up in the middle of the night, and, and I decided. I had the concept of what I'm doing right now, and I just said, you know, if Gearhead Dot if, if Gearhead Dot School is actually the domain you can get, and uh, it's available, I'm going to get it. And I've been sitting on it for quite a while. So yes, a Gearhead Dot School is kind of what launched me. Felt like you know the the heavens opened up and it made it available. I just like the name. Uh, it's uh, catchy. I can go to trade shows or car and coffees. I have a 10 by 10 tent, and everybody's intrigued by the gearhead school, what does it do, and that kind of stuff. All right, so let me get cranked up here. Um, probably the most, 
thing you really want to make sure you understand is I have a absolutely free, no require, no registration required, absolutely free career guide. I was in the industry as a in the public uh, school system in North Carolina for just over fifteen years. I've seen, I know what post secondary education looks like. I taught it. I saw what secondary education looked at because I saw it. I didn't teach it, but I saw it. And so, you know, there's a right way and a wrong way to get into the industry, the automotive repair industry. And so, actually, that's why I wrote the Automotive Essentials course is the stuff that's missing in the training. Then I turned around and pulled four units out of there and made this free. That's right, absolutely free is a career guide. So, if you go to the homepage of CareHead.school, you want to see uh, three buttons. Career guide free is exactly this. And what I did is I pulled, you don't even have to register. I mean, that's very low friction. You just push a button. And if you really want to know where the bodies are buried and the automotive career track, we got you covered. So let me scroll down and show you. There's a link right here that says go to the automotive career guide. And this is just some uh, explanation of what that is. No registration required, and there we are. So these are four units out of a paid course that I feel compelled to make available fully for free. And this is an area that a lot of you really should focus on when you're coming into industry to pick the right type of shop, the right education track. I'm not being melodramatic here, but I feel certain that a large percentage of people that entered the industry and went the wrong way left with the bad taste in their mouth and, and, and down on the industry because they made some rookie mistakes. It's just that simple. And I'll do everything I can do. I'll travel and I'll speak to uh, at high schools, car and coffees, uh, anywhere I can get in front of people that want me to want to hear what I got to say to try to explain the right way to do this. So here we go. This little coin opens up careers, and these are here again, all free over here, free. And this is if you've been here before, it tracks how far you've gone. This is an indication of how much you've, you've done. So it talks about shop careers, and you'll see every lesson and everything I do, uh, this is the same layout of my actual course. It's going to start off with a, uh, a overview video at the very beginning, as you see here, and that gives you an overview of this lesson. As you scroll down, we have a table of contents, jump links that jump right straight to a section within the course. I'm very big on just in time and low friction. So if uh, you want to find out what a BTEC is, you can go straight to the BTEC section. So I give them an idea of the concept of HTEC, BTEC, CTEC, the different specialties within the say a BTEC area. Uh, you know, are you doing line work? Are you doing undercar and stuff? Are you doing transmission? Probably not. Current mission has gotten so complicated there's very few manufacturers even attempt to build them in the field anymore. And C level tech. So that's a, also front end careers. There's a lot of uh, opportunity there for those uh, that uh, want to get in the industry but not necessarily hands on, but more the sales side. And mobile diag is another thing that um, I'm kind of jealous. Uh, this is cool. It was an option when I when I came into the industry. This is one of the. This is cool because if you're extremely sharp now, you, back in the day, you'd ride around maybe the van or a pickup truck with a camper shell, and you'd have your jack and your you know your tools. You see these guys and girls hanging brake pads in the parking lot and swapping alternators, starters, radiators. You know, doing things that could be done in in in, in a parking lot or in, on site. But, you know, I never really appealed to me. Now, you have some of its high-end diagnostic um, work. And now you're starting to get it's spread out to where you have areas. It used to be, you know, OBD2, kill the meal. But now, 
uh, we were seeing, you know, body control modules or body networks. You see networks for multiple and different networks that are interfaced, say for body, and then you have uh, engine control, trimage control. So now you may have multiple networks that are interfaced between certain boxes, so you can transfer information back and forth. And and uh, every manufacturer tends to do it a little differently. And there is a tremendous amount of mobile work now for the guys and girls that can that really can wrap their brain around this and the equipment to buy and you know, the system within their region they should specialize in and now you can you know you, uh, this picture here on the screen is john arnello uh actually it's anello i don't think it's an r in there uh john is kind of started this uh, i don't know 20 years ago I threw a number out there a long time ago and he he is still he has several guys that work for him and they you still see him at trade shows but he was kind of the pioneer. This has exploded. Uh, the uh, the mobile tech. But here again, these are not guys hanging brake pads and putting on starters in the parking lot for the most part. Uh, they're expected to show up and I have a stall to work in. That's that's where it's going. On. You know, I'm not working out in the parking lot under shade tree, and, and you know storm rolls in. And I got to grab my stuff and run. So generally, they're they they got a bay to work in. And uh, these are the cream of the crop diagnostics. And it's, there's actually, on this lesson, if you get access to my course, there's a video, a YouTube video, where um, one of the, uh, I think it's Tanner Brandt, was interviewed by, uh, on a podcast. And uh, he has spilled the beans that they're actually now manufacturers that are looking at this model very closely. Instead of having all this card buyback, you got a you know your dealership and this particular city, and the best guy they got can't fix it. It's it's a buyback, you know. It's it's, it's going to be a buyback if it comes back one more time. Uh, they're going to have to buy the car back, and the, the dealers are starting to look at a developing within the dealership network are contracting with those and then independent to work exclusively for the dealer. A a high end. A uh, diag team that actually works for the manufacturer and floats dealer to dealer and fixes the cars. Hopefully, fixes the cars that would open be a buyback. So that whole concept is actually being looked at as a viable business model within the dealership environment. So that's uh, it's pretty clever. Mobile diag. Like I said, this this is just this is all free. This shows you uh, the different types of jobs within the mobile diag and. Uh, shop types you know <clears throat> you don't want to if your goal is to work on cars you don't want to throw your toolbox back your pickup truck and ride around and say you hired are you hiring you know plan this out and so uh when you get down here again i'll bring it down and say shop types i look at every you know you got general repair shops brand specific that was my uh, that's what I did matter of fact this video that starts this off is a picture of the shop the business I used to own it wasn't this facility I was about half that size but it's 20 years later and this is a I think it's like six, six, eight, eight, six about 16 18 bay pure Honda shop on three acres of land and they roll and they if it is not a honda you're not you know you just that's it if it's not they only work on hondas that was the way i did it my first two employees and i got ready to sell at the 16 year mark i sold my first two employees that's the way they do it it's been a very successful business model so here's a brand specific shop you know you should find some toy shops and then you get into european or asian then that starts getting into multiple brands but uh that's a the thing that uh, it's like working a dealership on one kind of car, but you're working in a private shop or a uh, shop where you don't have, to have the, the dealer environment. Where in some cases the shop is necessarily evil to sell cars, but that's kind of changed now. A lot of the dealers realize they can actually, uh, the shop is pretty important. Franchise shops, you know, because uh, you look into that. Fleet operations, yeah, maybe you want to work at night. Sleep a little in the morning and run around during the daytime, have your days off. Uh, you maybe like the consistency of working on kind of the same thing all the time. You don't have a lot of surprises. 
going to have to do customer, you know, customer weight and drive. And it's called, but now a lot of times with fleet operations, you are working off hours when the, when the equipment's not running and the new car dealership and new car dealerships are really starting to step up the game on the service side. It's been going on for quite a while, but there's a time when, and I worked at a dealer that's like that and early in my career that, uh, sales and you know, the service side was necessary evil. I had the, uh, you know, the guys up on the front, the third floor guys tell you pretty consistently, you know, if we didn't have to have a shop, you guys would be gone. We'd be selling helicopters back here or whatever we can get. You know, they want to sell something. That's where the sales was. But you're seeing a lot of new car dealers really getting, ramping up and getting very serious about service. And that is a viable job, right? It's your shop types for automotive career. Training, this is where... On a replay, if somebody's watching this, I hope I can save somebody ten or fifteen or twenty or forty or fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars on a degree that uh, it just—it's sad. Don't, I don't want to get started maybe early in the game, but this is training tracks. There's one track that makes very good sense. That's public education. You come in here, you know, some high schools go primary or secondary. Some high schools have some pretty good programs. Um, I'm not going to agree any friends in this in certain areas, but I don't think it's super important. I mean, if it's, a, it's there in the schools, in the schools, good to has it, and it's a well run. Um, why not? Boy, should, should be careful because you'll see in a second. I want to talk about private for profit schools that are really hurting this industry. And the private for profit are looking at the ones coming out of high school that likes cars. So if you are a salesperson, where do you go? to look for young gearheads coming out of high school. So we lose a lot of them because of that. You know, it's you deer hunters out there, you know. You know, you go hunt deer where you threw the corn out, you know, the six months earlier because there's going to be a lot of deer there. Not knocking deer hunters, I'm just saying. When you look for something, you go to, you know, there's, you, you, you know where the, uh, if if I'm found myself being a salesperson for a profit for profit automotive program, and this this covers this tells you exactly. Matter of fact, let's go there. I would be going to high school. I don't like it, um, but let's move on. I will show you. I have a lesson. I think I'm the only person that's got the level of information on this. Cause I'm a little wanky on this, this entire lesson on private for profit schools. And it talks about this public schools programs, this private for profit programs, nothing they're like two different animals. So what does it really cost to go? If you go to a website for a private for profit, we're talking about universal tech, wild tech, NASCAR tech, which is universal tech, um, Lincoln Tech, these are all, and there may be a few more sprinkled in there. Of course, a while Tech went bankrupt once and they're back. That's another long story, but uh, at one location. This takes every single campus of every private profit program I'm aware of. Now, this is probably, this chart over here, I probably got 15, 18, 20 hours of research in this. They don't want you to know this. This comes from a government website, and you, you see schools. There's LTI, Lincoln Tech, NASCAR Tech, Universal Tech, and Wyo Tech. Every campus tells you the credit hours, average time of completion of months, student-faculty ratio, the cost if you have a place to stay, you got an aunt or uncle or you live in town, 
a place to stay costs two. You don't have a place to stay, and you got to either live on campus or a cost they've established it would cost you to live in the town. So let's just look at here. NASCAR Tech. I live about an hour from NASCAR Tech. You know, I'm in the middle of NASCAR country. I know people that work for NASCAR. I have friends that work for NASCAR. Not sure this is the best way to get into NASCAR. But 53 to 1 student to factory ratio. $49,000 if you got a place to stay. $60,000 you don't have a place to stay. You'll not get this number from a salesperson. So this is all in, this is all free. There is a chart. Continuing ed, you know, once you've gone through uh, formal training or you want to continue to train as you go through your career, then these are continuing education training options. You know, all the major seminars are in here. Should have a training plan to who you work for. Make sure you want to go to training. They want to see you to training. Who's going to pay? When can I go? You know, if you go to look at a new uh, place to work, you ask them about training, and they say, "Well, you, know, you got to figure it out." You know, we're not we're not going to we're not going to support that. Don't want to load your toolbox. You know, there's no other industry where they expect you to be an expert in the industry, but yet they're not training you at any if continue, at least continuing education, continue for the new stuff coming out. So it talks about you need to have a training plan. You have parts manufacturer based programs, which are getting better by the year. You got some pretty good stuff. Carquist is one of the major players. I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. They have a big training center in Raleigh. I've been down there a couple of times to look at it. I know some of the people that work there, some students of mine work as trainers. It's a uh, solid garage gurus, NAPA training standard uh, standards, more of a, they do on-site training by contract work. Um, world pack is, uh, has a lot of online training and instructor led for imports. And then you have training conferences. Uh, this is a show that I go to and participate in pretty heavily. This is about an hour from my house or where I live. And uh, it's also part of a, a group I've been with for, uh, it was an infinite garage in North Carolina and they merged with the tire people. Now it's automotive tire and asked the automotive, automotive tire and service association. The big guys out in Vegas, and then uh, then uh, TST is a private training organization up in the upstate New they're up north of New York, and uh, you know in the Terryton, New York area, and they do training year round. They they do training with uh, packages of local garages, and then they do at least one or two. This uh, TST big event is a event where they uh, uh, bring in you know, high-end speakers and have a you know, one-day biggie here. So they're, they're major. Vision is probably the, the biggest player for doing an expo and multiple-day training with probably over 100 classes to meet any demand, whatever you need. And this is in uh, Overland Park, Kansas. is basically a suburb of Kansas City. you got to take about a 40-minute cab ride out to Overland Park. And of course, me, I'm an independent trainer and I focus on the essentials, which is more important than most people realize. Also curated YouTube database, which won't get, may or may not get a chance to look at tonight. That's pretty cool. And uh, Keith Perkins, L1 Training, he has a lot of great online training, a lot of security systems, reprogramming. And we'll be continue to add there. This also covers AC certifications, you know, all about the the program, what it means, all the different types of certifications. So if you, you know, these people come along, don't know that you know they need to know this. This is information I put together on the specs about how many people, how many people are certified, and what percentage of the working techs are certified. That's all in here. So that is all included in the, the freebie, the, the free stuff. So we ought to go over here and look at 
uh, essentials real quick. Because I also want to show you the curated YouTube database. That's uh, that's my baby. Every uh, this is the sign up. Let me see. You can show here what we can. Cause some some admins. We get let's do it this way. Okay, this is the Automotive Essentials course, which is kind of flagship product. This is seventy lessons. And I'll show you a handful of them here that try to cover all the essentials, the essentials you need to know that are probably going to be covered. If you go work for somebody and they're sending you to Napa training or CarQuest training or, you know, conferences, these are things that come off the radar screen. They're not cool. You know, it's not the, the bleeding edge stuff. But if you came from changing the oil in your car and hanging brake pads and hanging mufflers on your car, and you just kind of basically like cars and you can't kind of understand them for the most part what's going on. You're not going to get told this stuff. Like if you go out and start working in the industry and then it's just going to be leapfrogged across all the essentials and you're right into entry level training. And that's why, you know, I decided I've always done well in the niche businesses. So I were in a Honda shop, nothing but Hondas. If you had you know, one Honda and three Fords who worked on the Honda, we didn't work on the Fords. And we were pretty serious about that. And that's why I've always done well in niche business. That's why I focus on is, is being the expert. And so here again, this is a, an area that I've kind of stuck my flag in as I want to be the essentials guy. So um, you'll see we have, it's actually, I think it's 70 lessons broken into about I don't know, 15, 18 categories. There's no requirement. Uh, you can take any lesson in any order. I'm big on just in time training, you, you don't want to start the first page and go to the back page if you need something in the middle page. So you'll see how this goes. This is very granular, even down to jump links at the beginning of every lesson. And we looked at it, and it's the terminology. You know, if you talk the language, you get accepted faster too. If you, um, so I'll just give you a quick one like, uh, this might be a great example here. It's going to open up here again. I have every lesson starts with an overview video that I make. And then we have a table of contents. These are jump links. It's got to right straight to here again. I'm big on just in time. If I need to understand what the heck is a longitudinal, you know, trans drivetrain, what is a, and what's the difference between longitudinal transverse and on and on. You can come right here and go straight to it. Simple enough, left side of the car, right side of the car. It's confusing to some people. Longitudinal versus transverse, long ways, cross ways. Simple, but you'd be surprised why people don't know what that means. And then they start using this terminology like drive trains, you know. Is it longitudinal rear wheel drive? And if you tell me that, I know exactly. We're talking Detroit iron. We're, gonna, we're talking a longitudinal engine rear wheel drive. We get into, you know, front engine transverse. And then we, you can use that to describe even like trans suspension systems. You know, if I say, well, you know, this rear end's got a pounded rod for uh, for transverse, and then a couple of trailing arms for longitudinal, and I'm hearing and I'm hearing longitudinal transverse type forces create a noise. Then I can use this terminology. Uh, but somebody else to go look at something on the car. So that when you read this, it makes better sense. Than I just told you. And basic car types, what these mean, different one, the coupe and the hatchback and the convertible. And pillar definitions, you know, ABC. Uh, there's always going to be, even uh, the tricky one here is this, or the coupe with no post here. If you opened up the, if you open the door up and roll the window down, there's no post, but it's going to be a B post because uh, you can, the C, the C pillar at the back is always going to, is the lowest you could be. So if you have a coupe, this is going to be a, implied B pillar, which doesn't exist. That's still going to be a C. Good. The four stroke cycle. We're okay there. Um, I got to pick step at the pace. So I don't want to spend all night long, but, uh, then we get into like engine terminology. And then here again, I'm trying to make sure everybody knows the right lingo and understands the basic essentials. They go further faster and you sound smarter very quick. Here again, jump leaks. 
It would, you know, basically it's spark ignite versus compression, gas plus diesel. It makes a difference in the oil. And, and you know, the C is compression ignited, S is spark ignited. Now, you know, pick a kind of oil up, look at the API donut, you know, exactly which one's for gas and which one's for diesel. How do you number cylinder banks on end lines? Uh, you know, the front of the engine, the definition, the SAE definition of front of the engine, horizontal opposed cylinders. In case they didn't realize it existed, and this is Volkswagen Doodlebugs, Subarus, and maybe a couple other out there. And I mix in, I only use YouTube videos, videos I make, I use everything that works. Images, illustrations. Uh, if I find something, I know it's a good piece of, I'll put it in there. I'm big on multimedia. They were talking about V-cylinders and how that, uh, the V concept, it's jumped on here. Good old fashioned V8 and how the V engines are going to, and the WR engine, the VR engines, which basically take like a here case of V6, pull in the V, the, the tight and have one head for a V6. Now it's a VR and you can lop off one cylinder and have a VR5. And then the W engine take two VRs, each bank is a VR and they're hooked to there's this crankshaft which just looks like a monstrosity. Uh, and there's some WH, W12, W16s, and uh, so let's move on to we talk about careers and shop types are also included in the, in the free uh, career guide. Get into hand tools. We cover you know what's the name of wrenches, socket drives, screwdrivers, pliers, yeah, screwdrivers and pliers. Here again, jump links to every, every screwdriver and plier. You'd be surprised when you know the right name, you know, with the Phillips and how they're numbered in one, two, three, four, which ones are normally going to be used in the automotive industry and where they'll be used. Positive drive is not exactly the same as the little marks here. And, uh, you did use a positive tip. Instead. You know, somebody, uh, Hey, Hey junior, go grab me a stubby screwdriver. Yeah. If you don't know what a stubby screwdriver is, that's a stubby screwdriver. Combination pliers, slip joint pliers, diagonal pliers, locking pliers are vice grips by trade name, needle nose pliers, duck bill pliers, and what these pliers are used for, like a band like this, snap ring pliers, internal, external, changeable tips, and ones with bent tips for special applications. And battery pliers, and it's because they they get this crudded nuts off a of battery, even and you can pair, put in your back pocket of your lot lizard and or lot guy guy and, and swapping batteries out in, in the used car lot. Do one more, and then we'll move on. Hammer, chisel, punches. Here again. Ball peen, plastic tipped, dead blow hammer. No, do not bring a claw hammer into a shop. You will never. You'll never let you forget that. There are no nails in a car to pull. Do not pull a claw hammer. Do not bring a claw hammer into a shop. And, uh, Flat Rate Master, he's uh, down in Atlanta. I've, I've uh, spoken to him on several occasions. And uh, he does a lot of tool. He has an entire video here. So when I find a really good YouTube video that works and fits, I'll, I'll use it. And then we talk about chisels. Why they're cold chisels versus hot chisels? Uh, a flat chisel and how you, and how you define well. How do you measure them? The width. You have the uh, the width of the cutting blade is predominantly the way they're diamond point, cape point, and punches. Different between a starter punch and a pin punch. Now, this is stronger because the shank goes from the diameter of the sole that size up to the shank size. But you can start a pin moving with that, but you got to move over to a pin punch to, to knock it all the way out. Center punch, transfer punches. All right, we'll get a shop physics. Go about another 15 minutes and wrap this puppy up. Shop physics. You, if Instead of somebody saying, well, you push this and this happens and this happens, this happens, and you memorize that, if you understood the physics behind that, you can apply that to other things that look similar. I've been making some sense here. Um, 
levers and gears. You know, is that a class one lever, class two lever, class three lever? So just kind of understanding some of the basic simple machines. And we, here again, give examples of how these levers are used in automotive. There's a pedal, a pedal cluster. Class two lever. So there's an example of class two lever in automotive. Class three lever. And, and gears are basically the concept. They're just spinning levers. They're actually levers uh, in a gear format. Uh, do friction real quick. You know, the coefficient of friction is a big thing on, that's why you got to make sure your brake pads are at least the same coefficient of friction on all four corners. So you don't want to buy, you don't mix up two brake pads out of one manufacturer and two more brake pads from another. You probably don't get the same coefficient of friction. You gonna have a car that pulls left or right. And so the, uh, this whole lesson is on coefficient of friction. So, you know, it's, it's a basic physics, but you can, but you understand this, you can, you can figure things out without having to go to the manual every time. Or if you build on, you know, you dabbling in as a rookie or amateur racer, this stuff comes in handy. A friend of mine races the SCCA, and uh, I help him out a fair amount, and uh, we had to break into some physics stuff every now and then. The coefficient of friction, how that's actually defined, uh, and then some, some coefficient of friction, some actual numbers, static coefficient of friction, and why, you know, th this could play into a, a car pulling left or right, locking up a wheel, could go back to a friction issue. And the hydraulics plays into it because hydraulics creates the force and the coefficient of friction is also tied into the force. So this is talks about how, by understanding this, is going to help you diagnose brake problems and, and explain why cars slide the way they do. Well, all of a sudden you're going through a turn real fast and things cool, and all of a sudden it's not cool. That's because as you approach the point where you're going to lose the coefficient of friction breaks down, the coefficient of friction on two moving surfaces is a lot lower than two static surfaces. So when you go from static and you start to slide, it's how the car accelerates because it, it kind of does cause it decelerates quicker, uh, slower. When you start sliding, you better let off the brakes, get a grip and go back. Tire traction grade on tires, the, uh, the traction grade. And then talking about kinetic coefficient of friction versus uh, dynamic right there. Change of state real quick. A lot of people, don't understand. A lot of people get a little confused on air conditioning. Right? Now, I'm not telling you how to put a condenser on the car. I'm not telling you how to put a compressor on the car. And, and I've had people who looked at my stuff and said, it doesn't talk about actually putting parts on. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you how it works. <laughs> Somebody else can tell you how to, you know, show you how to put a compressor on it. Bolts on with four bolts, and uh, it's got a bit of loading here. But um, this you know, goes to how you move. You don't make cold air; you move heat. It's impossible to make cold air. You know, cold is absence of heat. So you had talks about how we move heat by changing the state from a liquid to a gas, and then by gas back to a liquid. So. It helps understand that if you want to work on air conditioning. And then the basic air conditioning cycle that uses this concept of changing a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid. There again, a lot of times you, people working on air conditioning, they really don't even understand the basic science behind it, which helps. If you understand a lot of the basic physics behind a lot of these principles, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, it's a European car, a Japanese car, or our domestic car, physics stays the same everywhere. Fasteners. I've got a running joke here, like a standard fastener here. I'm very granular in the way I do things. There's a list on standard bolts, one machine screw, because that's actually a faster the standard, but it's not actually a bolt, and a metric bolt. So I've got three different lessons, so you don't confuse all three at the same time. How you define the diameter? How you define the diameter, how you measure it, the bolt length, measure it, and the pitch, and measure it, and, and of course, and find which one has better characteristics for like soft aluminum, and and, and the, the tells you the nuances, the nuance difference between coarse pitch and fine pitch, and why you see one over the other in certain applications. 
measure the pitch, and then uh, tensile strength. Yeah, if the markings are there, and so you can say, oh, it's a grade five or a grade grade eight. You count the grade, count the hash marks and add two. I don't know why they always got to be tricky on you, but you take it's not a grade three in the middle. That's this guy here with three marks is a grade five, and this one's six of grade eight. Then the drives, you know, do you know the difference between a Torx, a Torx Plus, and a, uh, here again, if you talk the language and know the proper terms, you're going to be taken seriously faster by other people in the industry. We know the Hicks Drive, the Phillips, the Allen Torx Standard, Torx Plus, that's a, this has come out a few, a little later, as it can handle more torque than this guy. Then in Torx, you also have internal Torx, external Torx. Safety torques, which has the post in the middle. Most seat belts or something would have that. They don't want you to take the seat belts out without a lot of grief. Make you buy security torques. Triple square is a European, predominantly European thing, but it has, it's, it's not a torques. This triple square means it's like four squares. You punch, punch, punch. So you have 12 points, which is far more points than a Torx is. This is big on the European cars for the most part. And then... And real quickly on the metric bolts I cover, you know, they're different. There's some similarities, but everything's going to be measured in millimeters. And when it gets different is pitch. And now it's going to be based on millimeters per thread, not threads per inch. It's a whole different number. You're like a one or 1.5. Like what the heck is that? It's millimeters per thread. Tensile strength's a little different, eight, eight and 10, nine. And the same drives. Torque to yield. This is kind of demystifies what the hell is a torque to yield bolt? And why do I need to know? And why do I need to use one? This gets into that as a more precise way of making sure you're stretching the bolt to the right length. It's, uh, it's different than watching the torque. This is the most accurate way to torque a bolt. You're starting to see more and more torque, torque to yield fasters. Use an automotive like head bolts. Other applications, the, the race car guys have been using them for years. This is a torquing down a Conrad bolt and measuring the stretch using this gauge. This is like a, a race engine from NASCAR days, Detroit Iron. I want to pick the speed up. I don't know about it. Here is all, every oil in a car uh, and what all stuff means on the lid of the car. Like brake fluid, we get into. Now, this is not the service. The service is down here. This is just the brake fluid itself. You know, we have glycol-based brake fluid. We have mineral oil-based brake fluid. This green lid on the uh, master cylinder. Beware. It's more likely to be a British car. I've never seen one. But in any green lid on a master cylinder reservoir typically means mineral oil, mineral oil-based brake fluid. You put some glycol-based brake fluid in there. You screwed the pooch, you're buying all new hydraulics for uh, this European English car, and it's not going to be a fun day for anybody. Then, you know, there's silicon based brake fluid you can't mix with glycol based brake fluid. Uh, even though it's higher boiling point, you can't do it. There are higher boiling point glycol based that are competing with the silicon based. And here's some of those numbers on the boiling point. A wet bone point is a certain percentage of, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, two point, it's weird, it's 3.7% moisture, and this is what happens at bone point. Um, and that goes back to some studies they've done, that's why they use that number. Um, maintenance procedures, every maintenance procedure on gas concealers had a brake fluid service. The one you look at now is brake fluid. Then we have one on the service of brake fluid. You know, the difference between bleeding brakes and flushing brakes, and how to use power flushers versus you know pump to pedal, uh, tire sidewall, tire sidewall information. Uh, every single letter on the side of a tire means right. I mean, I break it down. You could be uh, the tire wizard in your neighborhood. You know, every little letter and number means on the side of a tire. Tire pressure monitoring, manual and automatic transmission fluid service, like in automatics, we have, quote, sealed transmissions. There really is not such a thing as 
basically means they made it hard to change and they don't have a a, a, a fill port to pour the oil in. This is a good example of a quote sealed. I said, the drain plug comes from the bottom and there's a little, this is a standpipe. You got to pump the oil in from the bottom till it starts running back out. And, and that's, that's the height. And you'll see that we've got videos here that to watch, but if I want to take drop transmission fluid out, I take the whole plug out and it drains normally. When I fill it, I put this plug back in, which is a second plastic standpipe that comes up to here. I got to pump the oil in from the bottom. And I got a video of that to put the oil in from the bottom. There's no dipstick. There's no fill standing pipe on the top. I got to pump it in from the bottom. Fairly inexpensive machines to do that, like handheld uh, machines. And, uh, you know, to check, make sure it's full, I got to take that little center plug out to make sure it dribbles out that's high enough to basically come across the top of the standpipe and fall back out. ATF contamination, when you see that, it's not a good day. The the strawberry looking sludgy stuff generally means that your water and antifreeze, excuse me, uh, transmission fluid and antifreeze have gotten together. They're not happy. A lot of transmissions will use a cooler built into the radiator system so the heat generated from the transmission torque converter can be dissipated through the the radiator, the cooling system for the engine. So there's actually a heat transfer inside the radiator. If that leaks, it leaks transmission fluid into the coolant, and this is what you get. And it's not fun to, to get that stuff out and find you got to flush and flush and flush. And obviously changing radiator with whatever, more best cases, the radiator with the built-in cooler. Some have ready, you know, transmission coolers outside the radiator, which this can't happen to. This is showing pumping the uh, transmission oil back up the bottom through that center port we just looked at earlier. And the difference between a, a flush and a refill and a history. Let me see if I can wrap this up with a couple of good quick ones here. Let's go to electrical. This is the last thing I've added within a couple, about a year and a half ago. Not trying to make you a, uh, a trying to get the fundamentals, keep from getting killed. We just, you know, we start with an overview of electrical and even go into the atomic level so you really understand from ground zero, you know, what's a conductor, what's an insulator. Um, I think this is nice to know. I don't know if you'll win any bits at the bar one night, but maybe so. We cover all the three major the essentials on voltage. You know, what is voltage? What do you need to measure? How do you measure it? The current. All right. And then the magnetism, which goes along with that, resistance essentials. Then we get into circuits. So here again, we start talking about the right terminology. If you go through, you're going to find, you know, I'm using the right terminology so that you can talk to somebody else and they'll start saying, this, this person's taking the effort to learn the right terminology. Circuit faults, you know, short to ground before the load, short to ground after the load. It's a power control circuit, a ground control circuit. You start using this terminology and you know what you're talking about. Uh, it's hard not to be taken seriously. The voltage drops which is the most effective way to find resistance. Uh, I'll go on record saying I've never fixed a car with an ohm meter. I don't think I really ever have. And I look back. Uh, I know going forward, I don't need an ohm meter to fix a car. If you're looking for resistance on a load circuit, you want to do voltage drop, hands down. Uh, signal acquisition. You know, how do you, this is me sitting in the middle of the shop that I showed you earlier in the video. Uh, I have done some training. I have built, I've done some training videos in the shop environment. Uh, sometimes it's so busy, even late in the day, it's, it's hard. This is on a weekend. Signal acquisition. Uh, different ways to acquire signals without taking your barley pocket knife and you know, cutting insulation off. We don't want to do that. In the multimeter use and the basic, you know, how you use a meter to voltage and current. You got you, you to hook the meter in separate, differently. Control devices. You know, you, you go buy fog lights, you throw the instructions away because it's going to talk about, you know, you'll understand when you look at relays and control devices uh, how to do that. You don't need the instructions on fog lights. 
and then a relay, which is a type of switch. It's a remotely controlled switch. So I have an entire section on relays, so you understand why they use your relay. And we finish off with circuit protection. And all the different fuse families and, and you know, the different types of fuses, fusible links, circuit breakers. And that is all the lessons in the automotive, automotive essentials course. Here again, if you're watching, I see a few people watching, you can put a comment that comes right in to uh, a panel and I can answer that question. So if you're watching, I see two people. I see a number of two with their eyeball with their eyeball with the two, which means there's two people watching. Throw a question out there. And uh, cause I'm going to wrap it up here pretty soon. I'll stay as long as you want to stay, but, uh, there's another thing you need to see. This is, I just looked at my automotive essentials course. Uh, we'll show you one more thing before I let you go. And I'll wrap this up inside of an hour, 51 minutes. So I got nine minutes. Uh, the wife's in bed down the hall. I've got uh, a nice uh, office here in the house. I don't. I can work late and walk down the hall and hop in bed. I work a lot at night. Curated YouTube database. I don't think anybody's got this. And most people don't understand. You tell them. You try to explain it to them. They don't. They don't. They just don't get it. But uh, hopefully through this video, to watching live. And those who watch it on replay, uh, this baby, um, this explains just showing how many different videos. Why do I take some major YouTube channels, the good guys, and I know most of these personally. Uh, Flat Rate Masters, one of them, and no, uh, we're not diagnosed Dan, but uh, um, God getting old is, is is not fun. The uh, Scanner Danner, South Man Auto Repair. Um, a lot of people are real popular, but they're not real good at, at teaching. I'm talking about people that are real good. Not necessarily real popular, but they tend to be. This shows the specs. You can go in there and you can download this. of all the different categories. I think there's 100. And how many videos are, are in there and how long. So the bottom line down here, my YouTube, uh, my curated YouTube database is... Uh, 177 different sections, you know, like short to ground, open, like different sections, and the total runtime. So, the bottom line is there's 3,800 different videos with a runtime of almost 1,300 hours. You average about 20, 20 minute, if you average it all, that's a 20 minute runtime. So, let's take, let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, curated YouTube database. This is something nobody's got that I know of. I'm crazy enough. I taught school for about 16 years and I would develop playlists within YouTube to put the good stuff in for classroom because I didn't want to waste somebody's time. It didn't get shown in my classroom unless it was good stuff. And uh, just you know, about a year ago or a year and a half ago, I, I just started doing this, taking all the, what I already had kind of curated and put into a more, uh, a better interface and have continued to build this. So what I do now, you just have to just look, I'm going to show it, right? So this is, you're sitting on the YouTube curated database and these are, this can all see the, you got the eight, one through eight, eight based on ASC classifications, and then some other categories here. Let's see electrical systems. Uh, you could be a teacher and I need a couple of good videos for the day. You could just be a, a person coming up to send industry. You want to have just in time type training based on curated YouTube videos. Anybody can benefit from this and you can actually get this separately for like less than 20 bucks a month. What's that? Uh, two happy meals or something. So what you do electrical systems. I want to look into, um, uh, short the grounds, right? Let's click on that puppy. It takes a couple of seconds to load. It's bringing in a database from uh, Airtable. This doesn't have many. It says four. But some will have 15, 20, 30. But these are highly curated diagnosis 
of a short to ground and electrical system. New level auto scanner down there, ultra drop diagnostics, South Main Auto Repair. So then, now what's going to happen? Now, if this launch, it's going to launch that YouTube video. Unfortunately, it's going to launch another tab and you won't see it because I'm so, uh, tr I'm sure you're not going to see it. What it does, you can hear it play in there, can't you? So what happened is it opened up, it goes straight to, it goes straight to YouTube and opens that video up on YouTube and there you go. And then you get three, just close that tab and come right back to here. So you can see uh, parasitic draw. These are all electrical. These are just under electrical systems. At 32, and what I do every about once a month, I'll go back and, and, and all the ones I watch, there's about 25 channels I watch. About once a month, I go through and catch up on you know, the last month and categorize them and put them in. It takes, I don't know how many hundreds of hours I got to this one, but I, I spend probably 15, 20 hours a week just maintaining and adding new stuff into here. Here again, parasitic draw. Um, there's a slider here. Okay, so this is the description. Uh, what's to play with me here? The channel, so you know who you're getting it from. Because, you know, I, I have certain people I have a lot of respect for. South Main Auto Repair, high up the ladder. Um, Ford Tech Mocha Loco, if you're a Ford, you're looking for a Ford answer, he's hard to beat. And actually, I'll show you in a second, I do have the channels that I watch. So here again, these are parasitic draws. It's 32, so you start looking at the description and get even better, you know, maybe a certain car that you're working on that has a parasitic draw problem. Ford F-150 better dies every night. That may ring a bell. You come over here again, launch. It takes right to that video that you won't see because it's under the tab. So you'll see how, how granular a mobilizer fuse box, fuse and fuse box. And we have eight records, but it's hard to describe how cool this is until you actually use it. And here again, you can get this for like 19 bucks a month. What happens if you, you know, you get a two day look for free, then it's 19 bucks a month at the end of 12 months, you get it, you know, it, you don't have to pay for it anymore. You have access as long as I'm alive and you're alive, you know? And, uh, yeah, the, Here again, the free career guide, the course, and the YouTube uh, dat database. YouTube buys two separate, you can buy them together. The, uh, if you come down here to you log out, then you'll see a little different look here. You can go as well as I can. You'll see where well, you can purchase this for, uh, for a year and add on, check out, you can add on the, uh, Security YouTube database at a 50% discount. Um, these are public live streams uh, that you're watching tonight is a public live stream. It was posted to the public. Uh, I'll try to do these once a week, once every two weeks for the public. And then if you subscribe to, you know, uh, uh, Automotive Essentials course or Security YouTube database, obviously you'll have access to a private uh, live streams. And so if you come in here, I've already logged out. Okay. Questions you contact us. I'll look at everything that comes in here. And, uh, we have corporate accounts wrap up with that. So if you're a shop owner, I had to change the uh, platforms. Uh, spend a lot of time changing over the, for this feature because it's very important. So I have a lot of shops that were buying, my program for the techs and the tech would jet on in three months or wouldn't, was wouldn't engage in it. We have the tech will engage in free training. It's kind of like a dog would chase a car, but you didn't, can't fix it. It's a sign of a problem. Bottom line is now for corporate seat based plans. So, uh, meaning, um, if you bought here like a five seat plan and I can make any number you want, I built three, five, 10, and 20, but I can put any seat plan you want and price it to you. But then what it means if I did a five seat plan, I'm an independent garage and I've got several entry level people coming in and some floating in, some floating out. I can put five people 
five people at a time into my program. And if one of them won't engage, that tells you something. If you got a person you're providing free training and they won't do it and they're getting in the industry, that's like a dog chase a car and you can't stop them. My uncle, when I was growing up, had a uh, big rabbit hunter. And he'd come down my grandfather's farm, which is right down the street, a hundred acre farm, and we'd go rabbit hunting. And he had uh, some best dogs, and he was known for his dogs. He had about 12 beagles. And he'd jump on an airplane back then, like a small plane of buddies, and he'd fly somewhere in West Virginia to listen to a dog run and buy the dog and bring it back. But he, uh, he says, you know, if you got a guy, a dog, that uh, pick up a deer scent, you know, a dog, a deer scent strong of a rabbit. He's, you know, if he, if he says, I got a, if I got a dog that gets, it takes off and chases a, a deer and all my dogs run out, you know, two miles out in the middle of nowhere. It takes me two to three days to get my dogs back. That dog is, he won't kill him, but he's going to sell him. See, that's, that's a pet. That's not a, that's not. So <laughs> same thing here. If you got a person that won't take training and you provide and engage in it, you need to, you know, they don't have a place in the industry. They're in the wrong industry. Anyway, corporate-based pricing uh, is cool because you have a, a dashboard to see who's engaging, and you can swap out. It doesn't have to be somebody that works for you. Maybe you, you know you buy a five-seat package. You got three three techs that could use it. You got two slots open for the neighborhood kid that's always down there asking questions. You start grooming this guy early. Say, hey man, I got a little program here I can put you into and start teaching you about this. You go and plant. An idea in that guy's head that you care about him, and you do care about him. So you know, we don't care. Once you buy the seats, you, know, you bring two or three gearheads from the neighborhood and put them in there. So this is, I just added this. This is just, uh, and it's very cool. It's so much a month, and it's based on how many seats you buy. And I can do custom seats. You know, if you're I'm actually having a conversation with a dealer group that has about 10 dealerships, and they see the value to this and uh, may pull that off. Who knows? I'll wrap this up. I see it's been an hour and two minutes. And uh, this will uh, be edited a little bit and stuck back on YouTube as a video. Appreciate you guys and gals that come out tonight. And uh, I'd like to have a little more participation in asking questions. Because say in the future, anybody comes in can post a comment, uh, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, it comes into uh, my software, and then I can address that directly. We wrap this up. I'll get this edited and cut down a little bit and put it on YouTube as a, a regular video. Other than that, let me give the big salute here. Talk to you later.